Good afternoon. My name is DeAndrea Wilson. I'm a consumer education and outreach specialist at the Federal Communications Commission, Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division. Welcome to today's webinar for consumers, Avoiding COVID-19 Scams. During today's webinar, we will highlight current COVID-19 scams, provide tips and resources to protect consumers throughout the pandemic. Our co-hosts today are the Federal Trade Commission and the United States Postal Inspection Service. During this event, questions can be emailed to outreach at FCC.gov. We will have opening remarks from Patrick Weber, Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission. Mr. Weber is a veterans communications attorney with more than 25 years of government and private sector experience. As chief, he oversees the development and operations for consumers and disability related policies, consumer education, complaints and outreach to state, local and tribal government. Patrick. Thank you, DeAndrea. And welcome everyone to our consumer webinar on COVID-19 scams. I can't think of a more timely topic to discuss today. The COVID-19 pandemic has altered life for all of us. For many families, our children are learning from home. Many of us are working from home. Social, religious, and sports activities have been dramatically altered or stopped altogether. This holiday season, with COVID infections on the rise, experts are recommending that we celebrate from a safe social distance. A lot of the gatherings we are so used to attending this time of year have been canceled and trips to visit family, friends, or just to get away are being put on hold. Many of us have virus fatigue and are simply ready to move on. Recent news has given us hope that life may be able to return to a sense of normalcy in the not too distant future. Vaccines have proven successful in trials. Companies are seeking FDA approval for their use and earlier this week, healthcare workers in the United States began receiving the first FDA approved vaccine. And as promising as that good news is, we know that scammers and fraudsters follow the headlines and use the high profile and ever changing news cycle to try to treat cheat consumers out of their money and steal their identities. The FCC and our federal and state partners have seen this happen throughout the pandemic as scam campaigns have been adapting to capitalize on the latest information or lack of information. Early coronavirus scams offered non-existent home test kits or special supplies for diabetics, a group known to have more complications from COVID-19. A second wave of scams focused on consumers' fears regarding the economic uncertainty the virus was causing. Scammers also took advantage of the stimulus program to try and swindle consumers. By early summer, many long running scam campaigns, such as phony auto warranty programs, had adjusted their messaging to mention COVID-19. And we know that as vaccines become available to the general public, and as at home over the counter test kits are approved by the FDA, scammers will once again pivot their messaging. Today's webinar will feature speakers from the FCC and two of our federal partner agencies, the Federal Trade Commission, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Together, we hope to accomplish a few goals. First, we will walk you through the life cycle of COVID-19 scams. There are a number of federal agencies that are responsible for protecting consumers from scams. And we wanna share with you what various federal agencies do to protect consumers at each step. We'll start with the FCC and discuss how these scams first reach consumers, often via robocalls and robotexts. We will discuss our work to prevent these types of communications from reaching consumers and provide actionable tips for consumers to protect themselves from COVID related scam robocalls and texts. We will then have a presenter from the Federal Trade Commission who will discuss the FTC's areas of responsibilities in addressing illegal and unfair business practices. We'll hear about their work in both educating consumers about COVID-19 scams and enforcing rules against illegal scammers. And finally, we'll hear from the US Postal Inspection Service about their work 
to protect consumers and prevent them from transmitting money via the postal system to the scammers who await the proceeds of their illegal efforts. Our second goal is to provide you with links to important information and resources to protect yourself. Once the webinar is concluded, we will post the links that our speakers discuss on the events page for today's webinar, which you can find on FCC.gov under news and events and click on events. I hope you'll find time to familiarize yourself with these online resources. You'll find them to be clear, straightforward, and actionable. And they may just save you from the hassle and headaches of losing money or your identity. And if you're looking for a last minute holiday gift idea, consider sharing our consumer protection tips with family and friends. We all have a role to play in helping others avoid scams. Finally, through today's program, we hope to communicate to you that various federal agencies are working hard and working together to fight COVID-19 related scams. As I mentioned, today's discussion is very timely and I'm sure you'll find the information useful. Thank you again for joining us today. Now let me turn it back to DeAndrea who can begin our program. DeAndrea. Thank you, Patrick. Our first speaker is Kayla Hernandez Ujoa. Ms. Hernandez is the Associate Division Chief for the FCC's Consumers Affairs and Outreach Division. In this capacity, she provides strategic leadership with regards to planning, developing, and managing the division's consumer-facing outreach efforts and agency-wide projects as assigned. Kayla? Thank you, DeAndrea. Uh, today, I will be addressing COVID-19 scams, discussing the FCC's resources for addressing scams, and ending with an overview of robocalls and spoofing. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So I am with the Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division. Here's a brief description of what we do. As DeAndrea said, we do work a lot with the public through outreach and education initiatives to inform them about important consumer-related regulatory programs. We also talk to consumers about telecommunication issues and issues that affect and impact their daily life. Next page, please. So as we continue living through the pandemic, we have had to make many changes to the way we communicate, shop, learn, and just be. The FCC has important information on our webpage, fcc.gov slash COVID scams that can help consumers identify and address fraud and scams. In May, the FCC and Federal Trade Commission demanded that gateway providers allowing COVID-19 pandemic related scam calls into the United States cut off this type of traffic or face consequences. In their letters to these providers, they stressed that not stopping this type of traffic could cause them to lose access to the American phone system. Both agencies also asked US Telecom a trade association that manages the industry traceback group and also manages a consortium of companies that helps officials track down suspect calls to ask in members to begin blocking calls from gateway providers who did not comply within 48 hours. Now, before we continue, there are a lot of potential scam calls out there. Here's an example of what a scam call could sound like. Thank you. Now, as mentioned before, and next slide, please. There could be also the potential for a scam to be delivered via text. So here we have a sample of what a delivery scam text may look like. Next slide, please. The FCC has also created several images with short informative message to alert consumers about scams. Here is one sample. And next slide, please. 
Here's another sample of what that could look like. Next slide, please. Our mobile phones connect us to the outside world and are possibly the items we touch the most throughout the day. The COVID-19 pandemic has Americans focused on their health and safety, and phone hygiene is a growing concern. The FCC's downloadable poster, available at FCC.gov consumers, contains easy-to-remember information about sanitizing your phone and other devices. Next slide, please. The FCC also has a scam glossary, which contains information about robocalls and spoofing scams and related consumer fraud, which the FCC tracks through complaints filed by consumers, news reports, and notices from other government agencies. Though not everything featured in this document is a COVID-19 scam, around mid-summer, we updated information to include COVID-19 information. As more people continue to shop online during the pandemic, fraudsters are following online shopping and home delivering trends and adapting their scams. We are featuring information on how to identify and avoid package delivery scams by identifying the warning signs, which includes receiving unexpected requests for money in return for delivery of a package, often with a sense of urgency, or receiving a notice with a lot of spelling and grammatical errors or excessive use of capitalization and exclamation points. Another scam feature is the peer-to-peer -peer mobile payment app scam. As consumers grow comfortable using these apps, scammers seize opportunities for quick and anonymous access to cash. We advise consumers to review the app's fraud protection policies and understand whether and how they can recover funds if a problem arises. If you get an unexpected inquiry from someone who says they represent a company or government agency, and it's via these apps, hang up and call the phone number on your account statement in a phone book or on the company or government's website to verify the authenticity of a request. Phone scammers continue to prey on consumers' fear during the pandemic. Calling and texting with scam offers for free home testing kits, bogus cures, fake insurance, and more. Please visit fcc.gov slash COVID scams for more information on how to address these scams. As the race for effective treatments and vaccines for COVID-19 intensifies, scammers are preying on consumers. One of the things that we ask consumers to be on guard of is for scam calls from fake pharmacies offering pre-approved medications or supplies. When a consumer receives a call, the caller claims that the cost of medications is covered by insurance, but they need additional information to process a shipment. This could include asking for insurance details and information about their primary care physician. This information is then used to charge your insurance provider for unnecessary medications or medical equipment supplies that you as the consumer might never receive. Scammers might also pretend to be legitimate insurance companies. If you receive a call from someone claiming to be from your insurance company, it's okay to hang up and call the number back on your medical insurance or prescription card to confirm whether the call is legitimate. Next slide, please. We also have additional resources for persons who need information in accessible formats. You can send an email to FCC504 at FCC.gov. Next slide, please. The FCC recently released an ASL video on COVID-19 scams. It is currently available at the American Sign Language Video Library and on YouTube. The video offers tips for avoiding COVID-19 scams and information on how to file an informal complaint using either the website or through the ASL Consumer Support Line. Next slide, please. And now we're on to robocalls. And why are we discussing robocalls? Because a lot of these scams happen through robocalls. So robocalls continue to be one of our number one complaints. And though not all robocalls are illegal, they do tend to happen. Some of the legal exemptions include num pulling calls made to wireline numbers or tax-exempt organizations calling you. Uh, next slide, please. Here's some robocall call tips and that we also talk to consumers about. Next slide, please. It's important for consumers to note that most legitimate sources will email or, excuse me, will mail a written statement. 
before making a phone call, particular if the caller is requesting payment. The FCC is committed to cracking down on illegal calls, most recently filing a telemarketer in San Diego, California, nearly $10 million for illegally spoofing calls over a two-day period during California's 2018 State Assembly election. Next slide, please. Here's some information on spoofing. We want consumers to know that while there are times when a spoof number is okay, such as when a doctor wishes to display their callback number instead of the number from which they are calling, illegally spoofing a number when done with the intent to defraud, cause harm, or wrongly obtain anything of value can lead to the spoofer facing penalties of up to $10,000 for each violation. Next slide, please. The FCC is also empowering phone companies to block illegal or unwanted calls before they reach consumers, allowing consumers to block calls themselves or with assistance from their service providers, and urging phone companies to implement caller ID authentication to help reduce illegal spoofing. Next slide, please. Here are just some more tips to avoid being scammed. If you believe you've been a victim of a scam, immediately call the National Center for for disaster fraud hotline, or if it's a COVID-19 scam related to robocall or text, call, contact the FCC at fcc.gov slash complaints. Next slide, please. And here's a summary of our resources. Please visit the Consumer Help Center for information, which is also available in multiple languages, Spanish, Tagalog, Vietnamese, Korean, and Simplified Chinese. At our Consumer Complaints Center, you can file an informal complaint Check the status of your complaint or tell us your story. If you go to this page, you can also download the complaint form and find information for how to file using American Sign Language Hotline. Consumers who want to file an informal complaint in Spanish can call 1-88-CALL-FCC or 1-88-225-5322. And as always, consumers can always find more information at fcc.gov outreach or by sending an email to outreach at fcc.gov. In conclusion, I am pleased to be sharing this information to address avoiding COVID-19 scams, and I look forward to learning more from my fellow presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla. We will now hear from Carlene Tressler. Ms. Tressler is a senior project manager in the Federal, in the Federal Trade Commission's division of consumer business education. Her career in the consumer affairs and education arena spans more than 35 years. During that time, she has taken an active role in helping to communicate, educate consumers about issues that affect their financial well being. Colleen. Thank you, DeAndrea, and hello, everyone. As the nation's Consumer Protection Agency, the FTC works to stop unfair, deceptive, or fraudulent practices in the marketplace. We conduct investigations, sue companies, and people that break the law, and alert consumers and businesses about scams we're seeing, as well as educate them about their rights and responsibilities. We have a saying at the FTC, Education is the first line of defense against fraud and deception in the marketplace. Today, I'd like to talk about the many and various kinds of scams related to the coronavirus, as well as what the FTC is doing about them. Next slide, please. Let's go back one, please. Thank you. In early March, the FTC launched ftc.gov slash coronavirus. The site has four sections. The consumer section offers tips to avoid coronavirus scams, a library of timely blog posts and alerts, and links to other government resources. The business section includes information on how to get support, avoid scams, and follow appropriate practices in the marketplace. The enforcement section is where you can find complaint data related to COVID-19 
and the agency's actions against scammers who were using the pandemic to deceive or defraud consumers. And the resources section houses robocall recordings, videos, social media shareables, infographics, and materials in other languages. We also have a dedicated page about the financial impact of the coronavirus, with tips on dealing with job loss, trouble paying bills, including mortgages and car payments, and if it comes to it, your rights in debt collection. The page also includes information for small businesses. Next slide, please. One thing we know from all health emergencies and natural disasters is that scammers follow the headlines. They take advantage of what may be occurring in the news to find new ways to get people to part with their money or their personal and financial information. Since January 1, the FTC has received more than 270,000 COVID-related complaints. The total fraud loss is more than $200 million. This information is updated each weekday and can be found on ftc.gov slash coronavirus. Some of the top scams we've been seeing over the last eight months include online shopping delivery issues with in-demand products like PPE and household cleaners and disinfectants. Scam sellers are setting up fake websites and billing people for things that don't get delivered. People also are reporting scam text messages related to bogus offers to earn income, phony economic relief programs, fake charities, and government imposters. And as part of a broader trend, the overall number of do not call complaints are starting to pick up again after months of decline. The FTC wants to hear from you about the types of COVID-19 related scams you're encountering. Please report them to reportfraud.ftc.gov. Your complaints help us stop ripoff artists, scammers, and fraudsters. Next slide, please. Scammers send emails and texts that look real, hoping to trick you into clicking a link or sharing your information. If you click, they could end up putting malware on your computer or phone. So even if it looks like the message might be from your bank or FedEx or another company you know, don't click on links in unexpected emails or text messages. And remember that only scammers will insist that you pay by wiring money through a service like Western Union, or MoneyGram, by Bitcoin, or by putting money on a gift card. We encourage you to keep up to date with the latest scams by signing up for our alerts at ftc.gov slash consumer alerts. When you do, you'll get updates delivered right to your email inbox. Next slide, please. Pretending to be someone people trust is what scammers do. They may claim to be a well-known company or a beloved family member, but data from the FTC's Consumer Sentinel Network suggests that pretending to be the government may be scammers' favorite ruse. And whatever the pitch, they all have one thing in common, to get your money and personal information. When it comes to Medicare, Scammers might call to offer things like a COVID-19 kit, coronavirus package, or Medicare benefits related to the virus, but they'll ask you to verify personal information like your bank account, social security, or Medicare numbers. If you get a call from someone who says they're a Medicare representative and they ask for this information, hang up. It's a scam, not Medicare calling, and report it to the FTC at reportfraud.ftc.gov. The FTC is getting a lot of reports about fraudulent calls, texts, and emails coming from people pretending to be from the Social Security Administration, IRS, Census, and the FDIC. These fake government messages might say that you're approved for money, 
can get quick relief payments or get cash grants due to the coronavirus. Scammers might also promise you small business loans or send a phishing alert that a check is ready to be picked up. These are all scams and none of those messages come from a government agency. Tech support scammers want you to believe you have a serious problem with your computer, like a virus. They want you to pay for tech support services you don't need to fix a problem that doesn't exist. They often ask you to pay by wiring money, putting money on a gift card, prepaid card, or cash reload card, or using a money transfer app because they know those types of payments can be hard to reverse. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about some of the health-related advertising and marketing scams we're seeing at the FTC. First are fake treatments and cures. An important part of the FTC's work is targeting companies that make claims without the scientific proof to back them up. Eliminating false or misleading information from the marketplace is a key objective of the FTC. And one of the most effective ways the agency does that is by sending warning letters to companies that may be violating the FTC Act. The purpose of FTC letters is to warn companies that their conduct is likely unlawful and that they can face serious legal consequences, such as a federal lawsuit if they don't immediately stop. Overwhelmingly, companies that receive FTC warning letters take steps quickly to correct problematic advertising or marketing language and come into compliance with the law. In many cases, warning letters are the most rapid and cost-effective means to address the problem. To date, the FTC has sent more than 300 warning letters to companies making false cure, treatment, or prevention claims. For a complete list of warning letters sent by the FTC alone or in concert with other agencies, please visit ftc.gov slash coronavirus slash warning hyphen letters. The takeaway tip is this. We want people to ignore online and telephone offers for tests or cures. People on Medicare might get calls, emails, or see ads that claim to give them special access, maybe to testing or treatment. But that's not how Medicare works. They'll never call to offer special access or put someone in line for a test or treatment. Anyone who does is a scammer. Next slide, please. I'd now like to turn to the issue of contact tracing. Because there is no standard way tracers get in touch with people, scammers are taking advantage of the confusion. Legitimate contact tracers may call, email, text, or even visit your home to collect information. Our blog post, Help COVID-19 Contact Tracers, Not Scammers, offers a link to a list of state departments of public health for detailed information. It lists questions a contact tracer may ask. For example, they may ask you for your name and address, health information, and the names of places and people you have visited. The blog post also offers tips to protect yourself from fake contact tracers. For example, anyone who says you need to pay is a scammer, plain and simple. There's also no reason for a legitimate contact tracer to need your social security number, bank account, or credit card number. And lastly, the post includes an infographic like the one you're seeing on the screen that helps tell the difference between a real contact tracer and a scammer, and to report the fakes to your state and to us, once again, at reportfraud.ftc.gov. Next slide, please. So here's a little bit of good news. Just this week, 
we saw administration of the first doses of the vaccine. But for the most part, plans for distribution are still being worked out. While we wait for a timeline and more information, there's no doubt scammers will be scheming. Here's what people need to know to avoid a vaccine-related scam. You likely will not need to pay anything out of pocket to get the vaccine during this public health emergency. You can't pay to put your name on a list to get the vaccine. You can't pay to get early access to the vaccine. No one from a vaccine distribution site or healthcare payer, like a private insurance company, will call asking you for your social security number or your credit card or bank account information to sign you up to get the vaccine. And we want people to be aware of providers offering other products, treatments, or medicines to prevent the virus. It's important to check with your healthcare provider before paying for or receiving any COVID-19 related treatment. The bottom line takeaway is this. If you get a call, text, email, or even someone knocking on your door claiming they can get you early access to the vaccine, stop. It's a scam. Don't pay for a promise of vaccine access or share personal information. Instead, report it to the FTC at you know where, reportfraud.ftc.gov. Next slide, please. The coronavirus pandemic has not only had an unprecedented health impact, but is creating a once in a generation economic shift. Some of the top financial impact scams we're seeing involve job scams. Scammers target people searching for work and they do it a few different ways. Some scammers post ads online, some of which show up at the top of people's search results. They say they're hiring, but what they really want is to either get your personal information or your money. Sound familiar? They get people's money by either charging a fee for either the promise of a job or for special access of some kind. And some scammers will say that your first task is to cash a check and then wire money or buy a gift card and put money on it and send it to your new supposed boss. But when the check turns out to be fake, you're on the hook for all the money. So if you're looking for work, never pay for the promise of a job. Never pay anyone who asks by wiring money or buying a gift card. And do some research before you share personal information, like your social security number. Home-based business opportunities are also hot. Right now, especially during the pandemic, everyone wants to work from home. But there are scam home-based business opportunities. These scams seem real. They promise they can teach you how to make money becoming an online entrepreneur make money selling weight loss or other products from your home, maybe as part of a multi-level marketing business. But when they start talking about making a lot of money, paying up front, or talk about recruiting others to join, simply walk away. Don't pay anyone to be able to work from home without doing lots of research and talking to friends and family. And lastly, debt collection. Right now, a lot of people are struggling to pay their bills. So it's probably not a surprise that people are reporting debt collectors calling and harassing them. But we're even hearing about collectors calling people about debts they don't even recognize. If you're getting any of those calls, remember that you have rights. In fact, it's illegal for debt collectors to call you at all hours, to use profanity, or to threaten you. If a debt collector harasses you or says you'll be arrested or even deported if you don't pay, don't respond. Instead, report it to the FTC at reportfraud.ftc.gov. Next slide, please. Charity scammers follow the headlines too. Whenever there's a natural disaster or a health crisis like this, we can all expect to see fake charities, as well as fake appeals for money, maybe on social media, on crowdfunding sites, 
in phone calls and emails. The FTC encourages people to do their homework when it comes to donations. They can use the organizations listed at ftc.gov charity to help research charities. And if someone wants donations in cash by gift card or by wiring money, we tell people not to do it. Those are sure signs of a scam. Next slide, please. You know, there's a lot of information out there. Some of it good, some of it not. And with news updates and reports, it can be hard to tell the difference. Our advice to people is this to try to sort it out, think critically about the messages you're seeing. Ask yourself three questions before you act or pass on any message. Who is this message from? Do you know them? Do you trust them? Are you sure? Considering all the fake emails and phone numbers we've already talked about, what do they want me to do? Do they want you to buy something or take some action? What is the evidence behind this message? Do some fact checking from good sources. Even if you trust the messenger, does the evidence support what they're saying? Then let the facts steer your next steps. To get to government sources about COVID-19, start at usa.gov coronavirus for links to federal, state, and local government agencies. Next slide, please. When people see frauds, scams, and other bad business practices, we want to know about it. We use these reports to investigate, bring law enforcement cases, and alert people about what frauds to be on the lookout for so they can protect themselves, their friends, and family. And to make it easier, the FCC recently launched reportfraud.ftc.gov. This is a new version of the FTC's consumer reporting site. By following a few short steps, a person's report is instantly available to more than 3,000 federal, state, and local law enforcers across the country. After someone tells us what happened, they'll get advice on what they can do to recover and how to guard against fraud in the future. And the last slide, please. In closing, one way we can all help each other is by sharing good, trustworthy resources when we find them. I hope you'll share our resources in your communities. Thanks so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Colleen. Our last speaker is Elijah Hebert. Mr. Hebert is a Postal Inspector for the United States Postal Inspection Service. He has over nine years in law enforcement and over five years with the Inspection Service. Currently, he's assigned to the Transnational Fraud Team, embedded at the Consumer Protection Branch at the Justice Department. Elijah? Hello. Thank you, Deandra. <clears throat> All right, next slide, please. So um, like Deandra said, um, I'm a postal inspector assigned at the Consumer Protection Branch. So I've seen and been involved in my fair share of COVID related schemes. Next slide, please. Just a little bit about the agency. Uh, we are the oldest federal law enforcement agency uh, in the country, and we have uh, over 2,400 inspectors, postal police officers, and technical administrative staff spread across the country. So we're a fairly small agency. Um, and our cases deal both with criminal and civil matters. Next slide, please. So like Kayla, Colleen, and Patrick mentioned uh, prior to me, um, they did a great job uh, explaining all of the different scams uh, that you may come into contact with or be involved with. So I just want to um, emphasize 
the fact that if you think you've been scammed or um, if you've received um, a solicitation and you believe it uh, was scandalous, uh, please report it. Um, uh, the previous presenters gave a lot of good um, uh, resources where to go um, and report these different schemes. Um, and your reporting that will definitely help us um, as a law enforcement agency go out and investigate these type of crimes. So like any other natural disaster, pandemic or national emergency, um, we see a rise in, uh, in scams. So during COVID, when it started ramping up in February, March and April, naturally the number of scams went up. And um, Colleen and Kayla described great about the different scams that you may see. So, um, as, an, as a law enforcement officer, um, we look at these databases and everything that you report, and that makes our job so much easier. So it's a very laborious process, and we have data teams here at the Department of Justice and at, at uh, the United States Postal Inspection Service and analysts and agents, and what we do is we go through and laboriously look at all of these uh, complaint databases. So some of them have already uh, been mentioned today, but I will let you know a few more. And these are the ones that we routinely look at um, to get an idea about uh, what's happening. So FTC has Consumer Sentinel, FBI has the Internet Crime Complaint Center, IC3. Uh, my agency, the United States Postal Inspection Service has a fraud complaint system. The Treasury Department has FinCEN. And also, uh, if you just go online, uh, Scanbook is another one that you can go to um, and, and, and uh, register your complaints. Uh, next slide, please. So this is going to mirror some of, uh, some of the scams that the, pre the previous presenters have already mentioned, but these are the big ones that we're looking for in the complaint databases in order to uh, determine which ones uh, are most important and need to uh, get garner most of our attention. So this, uh, these are the types of schemes that we saw back in February, March, and April. They sort of tailed off a little bit, um, but they are still there. And I just want to make a quick note. Um, uh, this was before, now that we have the vaccine coming up very shortly, these scams are all going to be uh, coming back, I'm sure, um, but just in a, in, a, in a different sort of uh, manner. So, you know, things that we looked at, uh, companies or websites or solicitations promising fake test kits, fake cures or preventions, fake cleaners and di disinfection products, using products like chemicals, um, uh, pesticides for reasons that they're not approved for, um, failure to deliver. So people ordering personal protective equipment, masks, goggles, gloves, uh, and disinfection products in, which are never received. Um, fraudulent investment opportunities. You can invest in a vaccine or a prevention or a cure. Um, just send us some money and uh, you know, you'll, you'll make it back. And Schemes that we see, scams, we see them repeated all the time with just a, a slight change. So we also see the romance scams, the grandparent scams, um, and the, the advance fee and the Medicare schemes where they call and request your personal uh, PII information. Next slide, please. So how do us as law enforcement agency um, respond to a COVID scam? Our, our, um, we look at these uh, databases, the complaint databases, like I said, and due to the vast number of complaints, we need to uh, sort of handpick and gr grab the ones that have the, uh, have the most impact. So we like to do the, <clears throat> excuse me, whole government approach. So we have a lot of communication with other uh, law enforcement agencies, our data teams and their data teams, um, just so we are not duplicating efforts. Um, as one of the previous presenters said before, they had nearly 300,000 COVID-related uh, complaints that were 
that were logged. So that's quite a bit of uh, information and data that we need to go through. Um, but the main goal um, at the Consumer Protection Branch and for the agency is to stop the misrepresentation, uh, people making claims about curing COVID, um, stopping COVID, and all of the other schemes that we've already talked about. So things that we would do is contact the owner operator of the website um, and request that they take down um, the site and ask them to follow up on their claims if they refuse to do that. Uh, if they refuse to do it after they've been notified, we will notify the internet hosting companies um, and also look into the financial institution payment processors if they're running, uh, how, how they're getting paid and how we can go after that from a financial uh, aspect. And so we will also reach out uh, via legal process to banks um, and other peer-to-peer -peer payment methods. Next slide, please. So to reiterate what we've sort of already mentioned before, things to look out for, um, avoid all online telephone and text um, COVID offers, COVID related offers. If you get a, a call um, or an email, just ignore that because um, that's not how a legitimate COVID related uh, medical institution is going to reach out to you. Um, and like we said, the vaccines are just being rolled out. So you, th there may be an uptick in these sort of solicitations, but uh, please only trust uh, your, your employer, your physician or your local health department in regards to um, the rollout of the vaccine, that you're not gonna be able to pay anybody to skip the line and get ahead of, of the vaccine. Um, so um, just reach out to your trusted uh, local government agencies. And just to remind everyone, there are no cures at this time. And the only prevention um, guidelines that we have right now, in addition to the uh, newly uh, released vaccine is the CDC guidelines. Next slide, please. So I just uh, implore everyone to stay informed. Um, here are some of um, our websites and resources, uspis.gov backslash coronavirus. Um, and if you have any um, concerns or uh, believe that you've been defrauded, um, please uh, report them to all of the resources that will be provided after this uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elijah. And with that, it brings us to our question and answer session. So I ask all the presenters to come back on the screen and I'll ask a few questions. Okay, Kayla, you mentioned that some existing scams could now be included in the list of potential COVID scams. Can you provide some examples? Sure, thank you. Um, it was mentioned before, but it, I want to emphasize that there are still a lot of scams that were already in the works before the COVID pandemic started. Um, as mentioned before, working from home, from the FCC's perspective, we look at a lot of phone calls that consumers may receive or text. Um, this is a time when a lot of people are out of jobs and they, they really want something to help pay the bills. And so it's even easier sometimes for consumers to think that a call telling them that, hey, if you paid a certain amount of money, we you can make such an amount for doing this type of work, or a text that says that could could be legit, and it's really not. Um, as as it's been said before by my fellow presenters, uh, that type of information is just a scam. And another one that we are looking at closely at the FCC is the student repayment. So lots of students right now. Um, you know, they are, they're also out of jobs. Some of them can't even go back to their campus. 
And so this is a great time for scammers to try to tell students, especially those that have a large amount of debt because of school, just send them texts, the same thing, send them texts or call, telling them about perhaps how they can repay these loans. But they start to ask for information that's very personal, such as a bank account number, a social security number, there you stop and know that this is really not a legitimate call. Okay, thank you. Um, Colleen, as the pandemic effects rips through the economy, what is the federal trade seeing? And what do people need to know? Thank you, DeAndrea. So we talked a little bit about this during my presentation with debt collection. And I just want to guide people to our dedicated web page for information on everything from job loss, Homes, whether it be mortgage um, forbearance and foreclosure, auto payments, credit, student loans, and small business. The dedicated web page is ftc.gov slash financial impact. Thank you, DeAndrea. Thank you. And Elijah, have there been any prosecutorial actions against any of these COVID related fraud cases? There are a lot of um, active investigations as we speak um, that date back to the early spring when these scams sort of popped up. But fraud cases take time um, and we're only 10 months into the, into the pandemic. So to my knowledge, the only sort of cases that um, have been you know, brought about uh, prosecutorially are cases that have dealt with price gouging and hoarding. So there are cases still being actively worked and it, it just takes time um, and that's where we're going. Okay, great. Um, I have, let me ask you also, Elijah, how has the Postal Inspection Service handled failure to deliver cases? So the failure to deliver cases, uh, uh, one of the other presenters touched upon that. So that's where you make a, uh, make a purchase and you never receive your your uh, your product. Um, I know of many active investigations right now that are following up on that um, and where the money was sent to um, and they're just compiling the data. So um, although those cases didn't take a uh, I wouldn't say they were the top of top priority because the cases that were being looked at first were the ones that dealt with putting uh, people's lives uh, in danger and trying to remove that danger. So uh, those cases are act being actively worked from a fraud perspective. Okay, thank you. You're and Kel Kayla, any further advice on COVID-19 scams that the FCC is becoming aware of? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. So Right now, like everyone mentioned, we are looking at the development of scams related to vaccines. As was mentioned before, right now, yes, there has been a vaccine approved and one that is probably getting ready to be approved. But until then, if you receive any type of calls or texts that tell you, as before someone had mentioned, and we are also looking into this, that there's perhaps a line that you should get into or a center that you should send information to, especially payment, you know that this is a scam. Um, if you go to our website, fcc.gov slash consumers, you'll find more information and tips on the most recent scams that the FCC is looking at and information on how you can protect yourself and your loved ones from falling victim to scams. Thank you, Kayla. I would like to thank all of our presenters today. The bios and PowerPoint for today's presentation can be found on the pay on our events page. You can find the link to the events page at fcc.gov slash outreach. As we come to the end of the webinar, we will have closing remarks from Ed Barton, the Associate Bureau Chief in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Ed currently oversees the Bureau's Outreach, Education, and Consumer Complaints Team. Prior to joining the FCC, Ed spent 10 years as the Executive Director of Call for Action, a national nonprofit that partnered with media outlets to provide consumer education and mediation services. Ed.
Thank you, DeAndrea. And thank you to all of those people who have joined us on this important webinar today. Many of you have likely heard the old adage, the more things change, the more they stay the same. That saying not only applies to 2020 and the COVID-19 pandemic, but also to scams generally. As you heard from today's presenters, the pitch used will change. They reflect the headlines and increasingly may include seemingly personal information about their targeted victim to make the scam seem all the more urgent and real. While the message may change, there are some signs of a scam that stay the same. The fraudsters contact you by phone, text, or email. They often pretend to be a government agency, your insurance provider, utility company, or maybe a financial institution where you have accounts. The email may look authentic, or they may spoof the real phone number of who they're pretending to be. There's almost always an urgent need for you to act, a sick relative, a limited supply of the vaccine, or a need to confirm certain pieces of information in order to activate or maintain coverage and other important benefits. Personal information is requested or payment is requested to be made using a gift card, peer-to-peer -peer app, prepaid debit card, or possibly a wire transfer. Across the federal sector and in line with many state agencies and consumer health organizations, our advice and consumer protection tips also remain the same. Don't answer calls from unknown numbers. Don't respond to or click on links in unsolicited texts or emails. If you're contacted by someone who says they represent a company or government agency, hang up and call the number on your account statement in the phone book or on the, cover, on the company or a government agency's website to verify the authenticity of the request. Never pay with a gift card, peer-to-peer -peer app, or share personal information with someone that has contacted you unexpectedly. And talk to your phone company about call blocking apps and tools. Today, we shared information on COVID-19 scams and, like, and the likely next round of scams that will emerge as vaccines begin to be administered but the advice I just reiterated applies to all scams. We also shared with you information about a few of the federal agencies that are working in concert with each other to educate the public about scams and to enforce our laws that protect consumers. There are many others at both the federal and state level working towards these same goals. If you missed a website that we shared or want to connect with a speaker directly, feel free to email outreach at FCC.gov and we'll send you the link, the information you're looking for, or we'll happily make the connection. I want to end today by asking for your help. The pandemic has isolated many vulnerable people and that isolation can make them more susceptible to scams. Connect with the people in your social circles and networks, call a family member or friend, work with your religious community or civic organization, and help us spread the word. Passing along the information you learned today could prevent someone from becoming the victim of a COVID-19 scam. We at the FCC, along with our federal partners, are here to help. If you have additional questions or want to schedule a partnership meeting to work together on future consumer outreach endeavors, contact us at outreach at FCC.gov. Finally, I'd like to pass along my thanks to Kayla Hernandez Ujoa and DeAndrea Wilson of our Consumer Affairs and Outreach Division, who are responsible for planning and managing this webinar, for Colleen Tressler of the Federal Trade Commission, and Elijah Eber of the U.S. Postal Inspection Service for their informative presentations. I'd also like to thank Jeff Reardon and Steve Balderson of our media relations team. And they've been running the technical back end for the event. And again, thank you to everyone who tuned in for this event. On behalf of everyone at the Federal Trade Commission, I'm sorry, at the Federal Communications Commission, please accept our wishes for a warm and joyous holiday season and a safe, healthy, and prosperous new year. Thank you.